to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> roll call, Mrs. Mayor, if you would do the roll call, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Anita Jacobsinski. Here. Kate Mayer, I'm here. Tim Medicker. Here. Lisa Collins. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Tom Cruise. Here. Alex Zachary. Present. And Cheryl Hancock. Here. Okay, with seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Notice uh, board norms reflection. In your folders are board norms. Uh, if you would take a minute to take a look at those. We had at our workshop kind of a lively discussion about those, um, on those board members who were able to join us that evening. Um, a couple of them that I just will maybe bring to your attention is individual board members will support decisions of the board. I know we've had some concerns with those things in the past and just a reminder that that is one of our norms that we agreed upon. And then, um, Oh, I'm trying to remember the number. But the, the respect one, that we will respect differing opinions of board members, just to remember that and that we do act as a board, even though individual opinions go into our actions, the final resort, it, result is as a board. So just a couple reminders on those norms. So unless anyone has any comments re related to those, we'll move forward to approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, mm -hmm. distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, then I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. So we would ask that you come to the table off to my right. Good evening. Hello. My name's Brianna Basler, and I'm from Cochrane Fountain City, kind of up the river a bit. Uh, I live at S2618 Schlewien Road, Cochrane, Wisconsin, and I'm here to address the matter on my swimming co-op. I've been swimming since I was a little kid, and since my dad's in the military, we've been moving around a lot since I was younger. So I haven't really had a chance to kind of settle down and start swimming until I got into high school. And since my school is a very small school, we don't really have the facilities or the capabilities to be able to swim there. So I've been trying to set up a co-op with Winona Senior High School because they're the closest to me. But since they are across the river into a different state, it's very hard to set up this co-op there. And I've been let down for many years now Why well, my friends have been able to swim. And I've just really wanted the opportunity to be able to swim somewhere, anywhere. And to swim here, this would be the next closest place, and it would be an honor to swim here. I recently talked to the athletic director at the school, and he did say some not so nice things to me that kind of hurt my feelings, such as uh, us small town people, if we want what you guys have, I would have to move here. And it was not so nice, and I did not appreciate that, but I would like the opportunity to swim here. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? Thank you. Thank you. I have a prepared speech, so. If you'd state your name and address first, oh, uh, please. Nate Johnson, 1000 Saddlewood Street in Holman. Members of the Holman School District Board, the Holman High School Band Parents Group, the band, a bunch of people from below zero, <laughs> Mrs. Jensen, 
and Holman community members present. Welcome and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on this, e this evening about our worthy need for district funding for new band uniforms for the upcoming 2015-2016 school year. My name is Nate Johnson and my wife Tina and I have been a part of the Holman community for a little over 18 years. We have been raising our three boys in the Holman School District and they all either have been or are part of the Holman Schools band programs. Our oldest son Jacob graduated two years ago. Our second oldest Jordan is graduating this May of 2015. And our youngest son Jonah will be an incoming freshman next fall. Both my wife and I pursued music in college and early in our careers we used music as our vocation. Tina in the field of music therapy and myself as a music educator. From those experiences we have come to see music education not as an activity but as an integral part of our lives. Music teaches the learner math, science, physical activity, social interaction, and even healing. It gives the student a sense of accomplishment while teaching patience, dedication, and hard work. In my view, that is why music is part of the curriculum and given the weight of counting toward a student's GPA. While not everyone will pursue music after they leave high school, many will carry it forward, enriching the lives of their families and those around them. For example, our oldest son is a criminal and legal studies major, and he will have the privilege of traveling to Europe during his January term with his university choir. And even though he has graduated from Holman High School, he is still a representative of our community, as are many other students. I'm guessing even some of you have been part of band programs when, when you were in high school. Since our oldest graduated in 2013, the band program has steadily grown to the point that for the past two years, the percussion section, including our son Jordan, has had to use an alternate uniform that does not have the same distinction as the dress uniforms the rest of the band is privileged to wear. While the growth of the band problem is a wonderful problem to have, I can tell you that next year the lack of uniforms will be magnified dramatically. The incoming freshmen, which will include our youngest son, Jonah, are going to increase the size of the band to the point that nearly one-third of its members will be without uniforms. Mrs. Jensen will provide you with the facts figures, but you have to agree that this is not a good problem to have. Please also keep in mind that the band supports our athletic departments with their performances for pep band and, of course, at halftime shows for, during football games. In addition, they are um, our ambassadors and proudly represent our school district in numerous parades, state fairs, both Wisconsin in the past and more recently Minnesota, as well as several students who have represented our schools in honor bands in both Wisconsin and Minnesota. And as many of you may already be aware, we have been selected to represent Holman High School and even Wisconsin in Gainesville, Florida at the 2015-2016 Gator Bowl Marching Band Festival. This is a distinct honor and we want to send the band with a complete set of maroon and white dress uniforms. These students are some of the best and brightest in our student body. They work hard and are dedicated to being the best musicians and Holman Vikings they can be. And I think you would agree that they are deserving of the very best that we can give them in their endeavors. Now the band parents group has been working hard as well to, to help make this reality for the 2015-2016 school year by conducting several fundraising opportunities including the upcoming Legends of Rock concert, January 18th, 2015, in the Holman High School Auditorium, of which 100% of the proceeds will be donated to the Uniform Fund. And yes, that was a plug. <laughs> in closing, we are asking you to consider easing the burden on this dedicated group of parents and to show our hardworking students that the Holman School District is willing to throw their support behind an outstanding program that creates future leaders and enriches not only our community, but the future communities that they may call home. I again thank you for your time and consideration. Go Vikings. And now I'd like to turn the podium over to Lynn. Hi everybody. Um, thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to, to talk this evening. My name is Lynn Kinsella. I live at W8056 Maple Street in Holman. And um, my husband Terry and I moved here about 16 years ago. Um, I guess I would like to just bring a little parent perspective to, to this. I've been with the Band Boosters for, this is my seventh year, eighth year, I think, 
my seventh year as treasurer, I'm current, the current treasurer for the group. And I remember in original uh, meetings, my initial meetings with the group, we had a lot of discussion about how are we going to continue to bring kids into band. We, weren't, we just weren't getting the numbers that we had hoped for. We saw dwindling numbers. And I'm happy to say that problem's gone. We just suddenly, now we're on the opposite side. Um, how do we handle the numbers of kids that, that want to be in band? And I can speak to why they want to be in band. I've had two children. My oldest graduated in 2011. Um, she was in the high school band. Um, my son Brad, who's here, is a junior, and he's in the marching band, or in the, in the band. And I remember, as a parent, my first child going to high schools, is, you get a little nervous about that. And my daughter's first friend was a senior in, in the band who took her under her wing and showed her around school and made her feel welcome in a way that took a lot of anxiety out of her life. Um, these kids are amazing. They accept each other for who they are. They are, it's always a, a safe place for them to, to be. They, they're good friends. They, they have each other's back. And it's just, I'm not just saying that. It's amazing. And I've, saw, I've seen it with my son Brad as well. Um, it, would, it would be hard to, to say that we would have to turn anybody away who wanted to do this because we didn't have the equipment to allow them to, to be in this group of people. We, wouldn't, we just wouldn't want to do that. Um, I guess just in closing, I just, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I, that's really all I have to say. I don't have a prepared speech. I just wanted to share my personal experience. And, and I've learned a lot as well watching my children grow. I do want to add one thing. My daughter that I mentioned earlier is still in band. She's in her fourth year at the University of Minnesota. And she's in the marching band there. Loves it. It's been the best experience. She's made her all her new best friends in the, in the band. And they are going to their third bowl game this year. And she gets to go with us. It lives on. It, it, you take it away from here. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? A couple of you can sit. We also, if all of you are maybe going to speak, we have a couple wireless mics over there that go ahead and grab. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Bradley Kinsella, address W8056 Maple Street, Holman. Um, I'm a junior right now in high school. Um, I'm a section leader in our band, which is a great honor in itself because you need to work hard in auditions and you need to show leadership. Um, band is more than just a class because you only earn 0.25 of a credit per, sem um, per quarter or per, ter per term. And so people get more out of it than just the credit because if you're doing it just for the whole credit per year, it, you're in it for the wrong reason. Band in itself is a family, like my mother said. It's a place where you can go to feel safe. You can discuss things with your friends or your family, I guess. Um, as an incoming freshman, I remember clearly the first time I wore my uniform into a to a performance, a football game. And that was, I was ecstatic because I got to perform for my school and my friends. Um, like it was said, we have a growing band, which is also a good problem. But we need to be able to accommodate everyone who, so they can be involved. Uh, our band director, Ms. Jensen, is amazing. She does everything she can to make us feel welcome and to help us. Um, band has been the highlight of my high school experience and middle school experience. And it, it impacts the school spirit that we show. Oh. Uh, my name is Thank Jordan Marco. What? Thank yeah. you. My name is Jordan Marco. Um, I live at W6610 Casper Cooley Road, Holman, Wisconsin. And um, I am a junior at Holman High School as well. I agree with Brad um, that band has been the highlight of my educational experience, not just band, but the music department as a whole. Uh, being involved in music has added a lot to my life, not just musically, but educationally as well. Being involved in an arts course helps one to become a much more rounded student, just as if in being involved in theater or sports or other clubs does as well. 
Um, BAN has also opened a wide variety of opportunities to any of the people involved in it. Um, there are honor bands, music camps. We do participate in many parades in our marching band. Uh, we have jazz band. Our musicals uh, ask for a pit orchestra. We have show band and solo and ensemble, and there are many more as well. And through these, we are able to not only represent ourselves, but Holman High School and our community. And you can see us representing our community at the number of parades we participate in. For example, this past year, we represented the Holman community in our Oktoberfest and Applefest parade, and we placed first in each of those parades. And that isn't something that came easily. That took a lot of hard work. Uh, many academic courses, which BAN is, which I think is very important everybody knows, it's not a co-curricular activity. It's an actual academic course. Many academic courses are over in early June. Band is over in early June and starts in July again. We don't get to wait until September. And we have rehearsals all through July into August in preparation for the many parades and performances which we do put on. And that just shows the level of dedication that every student in band has and the love that every student in our band has for what they're participating in. Um, and it's very important for us to be in a uniform, just like if you're on any sports team. You have a different mindset when you're in your uniform. You're in the game. You're, it's not just like a practice anymore. You're actually doing what you've been working towards. And to have that uniform and to look like everybody else around you, to be part of that one band, and to just march down the street or in any performance, whatever it may be, is a very special feeling and something everybody should be able to be a part of if they so wish to. And it's something that's unfortunate if many people are not, especially with the growing band that we are going to be having in the incoming year. So band is just a very important part of the lives of all of us involved in it. Thank you, Jordan. Yes, Thank and thank you to the young people who stood in solidarity with their <laughs> band members. Good evening. My name is Michelle Jensen. I live at 712 Park Ridge Place on Alaska. Um, and I'm the band director here at Holman High School. Um, and tonight, I would like to share some facts and figures with you regarding the band program at Holman High School. Um, Linda Troutman is handing out um, just some facts and figures, um, some things that I won't speak to directly, but I feel it's important for you to know. Um, enrollment data, um, in information about our uniforms, um, information about the time spent outside of the classroom that the band kids put in and such. Um, so tonight I would like to share some facts and figures with you regarding the band program at Holman High School. I'd like to start by giving just a bit of history regarding the status of the school instruments. When I was hired in 2011, much of the school owned equipment was quite old and in disrepair. For whatever reason, the instruments had not been maintained and or replaced in a very long time. Since 2011, the Band Booster Organization has been committed to raising funds to upgrade and replace these well-used but worn-out instruments. Over the past three-plus years, the Band Boosters have worked tirelessly to fundraise over $16,000 for new instruments. Some of that fundraisers, fundraising money did come in the form of a donation from the Lions Club and the Mullenbach Foundation as well. Um, through my school budget, I've been able to purchase about $10,000 with some of those purchases being split over two years. Um, and Mr. Bear generously purchased a brand new tuba for us in the fall of 2013. We are in much better shape now, but we are not done in that area. And the band boosters continue to be committed to raising funds to upgrade our instruments. Student enrollment in the Holman High School Band Program has shown steady growth since 2011. Enrollment in the band for the 2011-12 school year, my first year, was 77 students. Currently, enrollment in band is at 109, and next year we are projecting enrollment in the high school band to be at 130 or more. I believe the parents and children in this school district and the students in our schools see a quality program in which they want to participate. Our current uniforms were purchased in 2003, 
At that time, 100 uniforms were purchased at a cost of about $36,000. These uniforms look sharp, as you can see, and they are still in great condition. Um, in 2013, though, due to our growing enrollment, we had to take our drum line out of uniform, and you saw what they are wearing now, their maroon polos and black shirts. We did this so that we could outfit the brass and woodwinds properly. It was a workable solution at the time, but with a projected enrollment next year of 130 or more, we need to add to our current supply. By purchasing 50 to 60 uniforms, we will be able to fit everyone properly, including the percussion. We understand that this purchase comes with a rather large price tag, but this purchase is an investment that will last 20 to 30 years. As you have heard, the Band Boosters are organizing a fundraising concert coming up in January. This concert has the potential to raise about one third of the cost of these uniforms. This, combined with donations from the Home and Education Foundation and the Home and Athletic Booster Club, will cover approximately half the cost of these additional uniforms. We are respectfully asking that the school district consider assisting with this purchase. Why are we asking? Because band is a curricular class, one that is inclusive to anyone who wishes to learn about music. Students earn .25 credit per term of enrollment. Most students enroll in band as a year-long class, earning one credit for that year. Band is a performance-based class. Each and every day, the students are demonstrating their knowledge and skills through performance in rehearsals and lessons. They also demonstrate knowledge and skills at concerts, on the parade route, on the football field, in the basketball bleachers, at assemblies, at band festivals like solo and ensemble and large group, and at honor festivals throughout the tri-state area. For their one credit, the average band student puts in 55 to 65 hours of time outside of the classroom. And with this growing enrollment, this is a very telling statistic. I believe these kids enroll in band for more than their one credit. Participation in band is not a graduation requirement or even a requirement for college acceptance. There is an intrinsic motivation going on here. Students crave the creativity, culture, community, and even the discipline that comes along with being in band. This program is worth their while. The knowledge gained in band directly correlates to personal happiness, social contributions, leadership skills, acceptance of others, the desire to communicate with others, the ability to adapt, all while reinforcing the highly sought after skills of critical thinking, working together, hard work and perseverance, ethics, responsibility, and creative expression. Isn't that what we want of and for our young adults, please invest in them. Thank you. I, I got a question for you. Yes. Sir. It's okay. okay. Sure. It's not the normal pro uh, okay. practice. Time. I was going to ask you, Cheryl, to remind me of what we're allowed to do with public participation. Well, because public participation, because the, the item isn't on the agenda, yes. then we really aren't allowed to discuss it. Okay. Um, that kind of thing and so we've really taken a position of not um, engaging no. now dr. Carlson will respond to those people who have spoken to us this evening and then we as a board would then ask for a follow-up um, ask questions so this is something that could potentially be on our agenda in the future okay. but just with the open records requirements those sorts of things so yes. thank you very thank you. much thank you with that said is there if I'm not allowed to do this or if it can't happen, let me know. But I'm just curious as to how many band members are out there. I would Can certainly I be happy to have ask band members that? stand. I just want to, if hands. you'd stand and wave at me, us. Oh, and some Thank of you. them are doing the <laughs> like float <laughs> waves because you are performance artists. That's cool. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board this evening? Please come forward. That's okay. That's okay. I'm glad you're here. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Cheryl Jacobson, and my address is 1409 Sand Lake Road here in Holman. And I have been involved with band for about seven years now at the middle school and high school level. And I was lucky enough two years ago to travel with the band to New York City. 
and observe three of their performances. And their, fir their first performance honored uh, veterans as well as active military. The second performance brought reverence to a higher power that I really believe unites us all. And their third performance um, offered the gift of music to the people of New York without any ability to pay. Um, these, these are the students I want to lead in our changing world. This trip was just one example. Every, perf every performance, I think, speaks to some of these areas. So I would just like to encourage the board to consider this request for funding to continue to encourage our, our young kids to participate in this very, very life-changing opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? Please come forward. Seeing none, I should clarify, certainly if board members want to ask questions or make comments during their comment time, they can do so at that point in time, which is later in the, the meeting. But, I, I yes. Just, oh, and certainly if um, you're here, we're going to be moving on with our agenda. And so if, um, I think Dr. Carlson indicated you were wondering if you can leave. So you, it is up to you if you want to stay and wait. There's a Packer game tonight, so I've been reminded. So we're going to try to move I them. I'm, I'm pointing over that way. <laughs> I was thinking about all these young kids who might be Packer fans that are sacrificing to come here tonight. So moving on to recognition and thank you. Dr. Carlson. We need a Packer. We're going to be funny tonight again. <laughs> Have you leave the meeting? You're welcome to stay. We do have room. <laughs> I wish they would have brought their instruments. That would have been cool. In 30 minutes. You have 15 minutes left. She said 45 to an hour. Go ahead. All right. Um, good evening. I am just here to uh, talk a little bit about something that our PBIS group and our entire middle school did uh, this past, past month. Um, and it was our HMS Community Food Drive. Um, and we titled that Kids Caring for Our Community. This is something that we've done uh, over the past four years is uh, a middle school food drive. It's something we're very proud of. We're very proud of all the kids that come through the middle school and how much they, they take part in this activity. Um, it was a PBIS initiative which, uh, you know, as we know, PBIS focuses on positive behaviors. Um, this year, we enhanced our school um, with a community connection by partnering each of our grade levels uh, with a local daycare. We partnered um, with those daycares of Children's Treehouse, Child First Family Daycare Center, and Children's Palace. And we did our food drive from November 13th to November 25th. Um, with absolutely outstanding kindness and charity, um, we collected almost 5,000 items. Um, with these items, um, we help local students and families um, who are in need, and we work to collect these items and deliver them to our local food pantries. So on Tuesday, November 25th, um, we helped deliver over 5,000 items, as I said, to the Holman Area Food Pantry, the Onalaska Emergency Food Basket, TLC, and also to stock up our Holman Middle School Food Pantry. So on behalf of the middle school, our PBIS team, I just want to extend uh, my appreciation for our students and for our families and for our community uh, for their generosity in, in giving back. Um, this is something that we are proud to say that we do. We don't know a lot of middle schools that do something like this. And uh, I'm very, very proud and honored to be part of the middle school and to be part of this. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vogler. And thank you for leading the school district or the middle school in that direction. It sounds like a great activity. So Who delivers you. all that stuff? I'm sorry, what? Who delivers all that? Because uh, that's a lot of 5,000 items is huge. Is it school. staff? Is it volunteers? Um, we spend that Tuesday uh, before Thanksgiving. Um, splitting up the items, separating the items to make sure that to the different food pantries we, we donate as equally as possible. And then um, we have an assembly at the end of the day where we recognize the students. We recognize some other things that are going on at that time. 
and then uh, the food pantries come and uh, we help them load their trucks and then they they take it back to the pantry and this isn't the first year you've done this right no this is the fourth year fourth year. actually it's the fourth year that I know about it <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it's it had happened uh, before that time that's, that's a very cool thing for our kids I thank you for that absolutely Okay, thank you very much. Then moving on to reports and discussion, the um, below zero holiday store students, if you would come forward to present. <coughs> All right. Good evening all and thank you for allowing our entrepreneurship class to come in and present to you tonight. We look forward to sharing you with information that we have been learning over the past few months pertaining to our store Below Zero. To start off, here is just a basic overview of the entrepreneurship class in which we are all enrolled. Um, the entrepreneurship class is the top marketing and business class offered at Holman High School. Only seniors who have completed both the marketing and business concepts class and the advanced marketing class are allowed to take it. Um, the goal of this class is really to explore entrepreneurial experiences and we do that in two different ways. Um, one by li visiting with different local entrepreneurs through some field trips and then also with the opening and operating of our own store below zero. The first way we gain these experiences is through field trips to local businesses. It is a class requirement that all students book a field trip to one of these local businesses. Here we are allowed to experience firsthand of what the business goes through. We have them do this to teach them more about professionalism as well. Some places we have already been to are Empire Screening, Dan Anderson's Farm, the YMCA, Eckers App Orchard, Ferguson's App Orchard, and the Children's Museum. Additionally, we also participated in some team building events at the High Ropes course just outside in the high school and that was a great way to get connected and come together as a team before the opening of our own store. The second part of the class is opening and running our own model store, Below Zero. This is the name and the logo we chose with the tagline, Seize the Freeze. One of the first decisions we made after the logo and the tagline and whatnot was the mission statement. And we use this mission statement as kind of our guide in deciding what, how we're going to act and how we're going to um, create the store. And our mission statement is as follows. As students striving to achieve an entrepreneurial experience, we will maintain an enthusiastic attitude while creating positive customer relations. After these large class decisions we agreed upon, we divided each individual into a different department. <coughs> Becca and I are the two store managers, while we have a manager for each of our four departments with six or seven other employees. These managers and departments include promotions, sales, human resources, and operations. <coughs> we now have each department manager come forward to talk a little more about their department. First off, as you have probably realized, Courtney and I are the store managers of Below Zero. We were voted into this position by the class. Um, as store managers, we really just work to provide assistance and answers for all members of the class and just try to be positive, engaged leaders of the store. Um, well, I'm Maddie. Um, I'm from Promotions Department. I'm Jenna, and I'm from the Promotions Department as well. I'm Haley Lemke, and I'm from the Promotions Department. I'm Emma Bame and I'm from the Promotions Department. I am Josh Lewis and I'm from the Promotions Department. Alright, and I'm Lydia Shiver and I'm the Promotions Manager. And what we are entailed to do our duties include creating the itinerary for the grand opening and any promotion. So we were in charge of flyers and bulletin boards around the school as well as bulletin boards in other community businesses and the schools. Thank you. And next we'll have our sales department step forward. Hi, I'm Kellen Lamore and I am the sales department manager. And our role is pretty much to go out, out in the business the world and find businesses to give products to our store. And we sell their products for a $25 vendor fee. 
and all the products they sell in our store and make their profit, it goes back to them. And there's also a uh, product donation, and that is pretty much where they give the product to us, and everything that they sell goes back to the family that we are uh, doing it for. And then we also have just a cash donation, and all the cash donation is given to the family that we are doing it for. Um, my name is Caitlin Levinsky, and I'm part of the sales department. I'm Melissa Adelman. I'm part of the sales department. I'm Lucy Anderholm. Grant. Hi, Grant. <laughs> and I'm Jacob Chuma. And next we have our Human Resources Department. And then lastly, our operations department. Hi, I'm Ashlyn Fonsted, and I'm the manager of the operations department. And these are the employees of the department. I'm Izzy Fasten. I'm Kayla Frank. I'm Jennifer. I'm Tyler Church. I'm Chuck Yang. And as the operations department, we're basically the accountants of the business, so we price all the items and put it in the inventory system, in which we did create our own inventory system, so that was a good learning experience for us. All right, so now that you have a better idea of what we do during this class time, it's important you know the bigger picture of the store and class. For the past few years, the entrepreneurship class has decided to donate all or most proceeds to a local family in need. This year, we have chosen the Jacob Schrader family. He is currently a middle school student in seventh grade, and he has undergone many different health problems. Amongst them are spina bifida, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, and has undergone more than 21 major surgeries in a short 12 years. He still remains positive, happy, and loving. We will be donating proceeds to, from the silent auction, vendors' fees, donations, and the, from the shoppers in the store. At the actual store, we'll be selling a variety of homemade craft items, cute little stocking stuffers and gifts for everyone on your list. Um, we have scarves and Holman apparel. We have purses and jewelry um, and even some furniture. So there's something for everyone at our store. These are a few of our vendors and sponsors for the store. Um, we have Becky Reber, Allison Shriver, Gloria Jean's Coffee, Sally Pronchinski, Sunburst Soaps and the Marketing Classes, Maggie's on Main, and Festival Foods. And all of these people and organizations have um, played a large role in providing product and um, sponsorship for us and the store, and we thank them. They're just a little bit, though. We have a lot more. All of these great gifts will be available for purchase during Below Zero's openings. We'll be open the week of December 11th through the 19th, with the grand opening on December 13th. Our hours are Monday through Friday, 3 to 8, and Saturday, 9 to 4, and we are closed on Sunday. Like previously mentioned, the grand opening of Below Zero will be December 13th, that's this Saturday, from 9 to 4 p.m. Um, as uh, students in the class, we have mandatory attendance from 7 to 10 so that we can all be there for the festivities. And we would love to see all of you and um, some community members present there too so you can shop and kind of see what we've been working on. Um, we will have lots of different entertainment and we'll have some refreshments and we have invitations for you all too. So we'll be handing those out at the end as well. Where is it? It is at, yeah, that's probably something you should know. It's right here, um, the Holman High School Commons, and then our store is in the newly renovated school store. Next to the bank or the credit union? Yes, right in there. So <laughs> it's, it's good so you can get the money from there. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and then spend it. <laughs> right. Also throughout the course, students are responsible for working at least six hours during Below Zero's opening. The schedule has been created by our lovely Human Resource Department and they work very diligently to accommodate everyone's needs. 
They've learned a lot about how difficult scheduling can be as we all have to work together and learn about customer relations. So with that, we'd just like to thank you for allowing us to present and listen to what we have to say about our store below zero. Um, we hope this gave you a better idea of our class and our store, and we would love to see you at the grand opening and shopping event. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you once again, and um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Any questions? I'm going to keep it brief because, you know, the Packers are playing, but every year when DECA presents, I like to say that DECA changed the lives of two of my five daughters and what DECA taught them was incredible. The experiences were beyond belief and I'm so proud of our, our Holman School District's chapter. I'm very glad to see Charlie Yang. Where are you, Charlie? You had to leave. Um, he snuck out. He had to leave, you know, um, to invite other cultures into DECA um, and to get um, um, cultures into the business world I think is so important so it's really wonderful to see him um, and yes I'll, I'll be at your store but um, <laughs> who is your sponsor again can you have him or her stand up your advisor oh yes of course uh, Miss Bresky and Mr. Shriver are the um, the are backbone they, are they in the corner <laughs> why don't you They're give away the there. <laughs> I, I would just like for them to come stand behind you because I think that yeah the come public, up here come up here <laughs> the public needs like to, to see in, them they, like to stay in the shadows. they do like to stay in the shadows but the amount of work that I know that yeah these Thank you. folks do here they come very slowly <laughs> with Thank their t-shirts I can't come to Thank the grand you. opening I have um, a gymnastics I, I always come and shop oh, oh, Thank you here, both of you for what you <laughs> do to change these yeah, kids okay. and to make them go out. I know that also my daughters were taught through DECA that it wasn't business, but there were um, humanitarian contributions. And both of the kids that went into business have that piece of them. Um, they're making good money, no doubt. <laughs> they're in business, but they're giving back to the communities. They're volunteering. And you know what? They learned that all here in Holman through DECA. I think thank that's you. huge. Yes, thank you very much. We appreciate it. I know every year we enjoy hearing the presentation and we do in, um, enjoy the just the different nuance in each new theme and um, that you have. So thank you so very much for coming this evening and for thank your you presentation. For we us. always enjoy it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to nor new course proposals. Uh, Mr. Bayer. I'm going to start us off. Okay. Uh, one of the tech ed teachers, uh, A. Reagan. Would you mind sitting at the the, the, oh, the microphone? Yes. I'm used to talking in front of people. I know. Be loud all the time. It's just so. that <laughs> the way that since you're talking about technology class, the way that technology picks up the speech and when it's broadcast. So. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I'm A. Reagan. We have Tim Bakeberg and Dan Lilla here. And um, I know the Packers are playing tonight, but I think they're ESPN. And all three of us don't have cable, so we have nowhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, actually, probably about a year ago, uh, the math department approached us about uh, potentially looking at doing a tech ed math class. And what we're not asking for a new proposal tonight. We're just trying to inform you guys of what we have going on and what we're potentially looking at doing. Um, so. What we've done over about a year now is just start looking at, trying to look at our curriculum, look at what math does, and see is there a fit between the departments, and is there a need for us to be doing this. Um, and so we have a little PowerPoint here just to kind of show you guys some of the information that we've come up with so far. Thanks. Um, and good evening. Again, I'm Tim Bakeberg, uh, one of the Tech Ed instructors. I teach the woodworking and uh, the CAD classes at the high school. Um, so the intro to technology, I'm fairly new to the district, my second year here, but I know intro to technology has been on the books. Uh, it's been a course that's been offered for, for a number of years. My colleagues could, pro wow, it really does clear out in here. Um, um, uh, my colleague could probably tell you how long uh, we've offered the course. Uh, it was always a half uh, credit or a one-term course. Uh, so what we're proposing uh, is really uh, doing a couple of things. One, we want to stretch that course over to a two-term, so it'd be a one-credit 
Um, and then, of course, uh, as Abe already mentioned, the, the big, vast change is that we want to add that math equivalency credit option um, to it um, to, again, uh, kind of marriage uh, the math uh, to the, what we're doing down in the tech ed area um, and really extract those concepts out. So I, I'm not going to read the description, but uh, it, it, it's right there for you. So. <clears throat> Yep. I'm Dan Lilla, as uh, Abe mentioned, another technology education instructor at the high school. Uh, I guess when we started this discussion last spring, uh, we, we uh, first came about with some ideas about why we were doing this or why we were proposing this course. And uh, one of the things we came up with, there's a few different ones. Uh, one of them was the need with uh, students uh, struggling in Algebra 1. We had uh, taken some data through our high school guidance office. And uh, you can, as you can see up there, we had about 29% of our uh, first time Algebra 1 students at, in last school year that had uh, failed it on the first attempt. Um, we also had a presentation from Cambridge Learning where uh, they mentioned how 60% of the math questions on the ACT test are at a level of eighth grade or, or lower. And uh, we, we've heard it, a, a few different times, especially from our state technology education uh, director, that uh, this this course or any math equivalency course uh, statewide is, is provides a means of um, allowing students to have that math credit um, and giving them options uh, in a different way. And, uh, and we think it's going to provide a really good uh, option of uh, hands-on through application and, and the types of uh, things that we do in our technology education department. So the, the big question always is, where is this course going to fit if you look at the sequential um, pattern? And, and what we're looking at, again, is we want to meet those students of, that are coming into the high school. Uh, so we're looking primarily freshman, sophomore level. Uh, let's give them that foundation of Algebra 1 concepts, geometry concepts, through that hands-on learning, um, through relevant and some relevancy into it. Um, and so, yeah, it, it would be for, for that group of students, not that we couldn't have a junior or a senior that could also benefit from a course such as this. So uh, we've, we've uh, met with the math department, uh, especially Doug Burge in particular. Uh, we've uh, not only collaborated with them uh, to some regard, but you know, as we develop this further, we're going to be, uh, the next step is to perform a crosswalk, which is a, uh, basically a way of uh, seeing what uh, concepts in our class and what concepts in, in the math standards are going to overlap or are going are to meet. And then uh, by doing that, we're going to be able to extract or pull out some of the stuff that, that we're already doing and, and things that are going to be in this class in order to, um, to meet those uh, math standards. And uh, we're, we're also going to be looking a little bit further into uh, areas that students struggle with. Uh, in in, uh, in math and see if we can uh, maybe fill those needs and um, after the crosswalk is performed uh, I guess the next after that we would be coming back to the school board to um, ask for approval and then uh, then it is submitted on to uh, DPI for um, for the math equivalency from the state process or the state end of it okay um. Are there questions at this point? If, if I may, before questions, just to add a little bit, uh, Mrs. Savasky, I'm, I'm sorry, she's not here. She's attending the Slate Technology Conference for a couple of days, and so otherwise she'd be assisting reporting. So I'm just going to report a little bit out of Curriculum Council. Um, several of us were there. But the, uh, the intent right now, the Curriculum Council as a whole supports this concept, supports moving forward. That's why they're here tonight. And so um, we want to, you see on your agenda on the issue paper that it talks about a December 22nd board meeting or board um, consideration for approval. Uh, that's tentative. And as you already heard, there's work to be done. But the, from the curriculum council, this is a little different. For those of you that have been through this process multiple times, you'd be presented tonight <coughs> in the next board meeting is approval of actually the course and then it's inserted into the 
course catalog and it's a go and so on. This is a little different. Bringing the concept to curriculum council, support of the concept moving forward, and I believe there might even be a need to go actually come back to curriculum council prior to coming back here to the board. So uh, probably not the December 22nd board meeting at this point. Question. Questions? Why? I'm sorry. Why, why you guys, why isn't this class being offered in math departments? Uh, originally, we were we were approached um, uh, uh, after the first of the year last year. Um, uh, Doug and, uh, and and Mr. Bear approached us. Uh, the math, the the three credits of math uh, was required uh, from the state at about that time last year, and shortly after that, the math equivalency was an option. Um, and, and they approached us to see if we would be interested um, to offer something like this down in our area. Um, I see it every day in the classroom. Uh, math is, is an, in its own little silo at the high school. Uh, we, we teach math. We don't always use the same terminology that the math instructors do. Uh, we've got our own industry uh, terminology that we use, uh, but, but we teach math down there. And, and we see the students struggle with some of those real basic math <laughs> concepts, um, and, and we want to try to help that um, across the board. Do you use... Um some of the software available? I mean, Excel and Access and that type of thing, or is it straight up math? Uh, for this course? For, the, for this class? For this class, what we would like to do is, is make it project-based. Uh, take the projects. Intro to technology really spans across all our different areas, so um, mechanical, um, drafting, uh, graphic <coughs> arts, welding and metals, <coughs> uh, woodworking, carpentry, uh, agri-science is in there and, and we have projects and we have um, hands-on activities that we currently do in the intro to technology course um, our idea is to extract and really emphasize the math component uh, that maybe we haven't really focused on so much in the past um, and draw those out and we're, we're tech ed teachers <laughs> we're really good at the hands-on we're, we're great in our in our discipline uh, we can't do this well without the math department sitting down with us at the table and and looking over what we teach uh, our curriculum and say here's this is geometry this is algebra here are the concepts let's really focus in on those concepts um, give them the foundation apply it so when they go to math class and they advance on uh, they can draw back on some of those experiences they had an in intro to technology is is the thought so we'd be utilizing our software and our equipment and our different means that we have to, to show that application, as Tim mentioned. So. I, make, I make my living with Excel and Access, uh, being a data miner. <clears throat> and I know the kids that come to work for us, that uh, you know, a lot of them don't have much exposure to Excel and, and doing the math and the formulas and stuff in Excel. There's a real need for it out there. That's why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, not a question so much because I was privileged enough to sit on curriculum council as as all of you were talking about this and um, we talked about the focus and the movement toward identifying and honoring that math is taught in many <coughs> different fields besides just the math department and that many first world countries have been doing this forever giving math credits for what you're doing. We also spoke about the difference between application math and math math. But that's the only thing I'm able to call it. And there was some discussion about the fact that there are gifted mathematicians in your classes that don't do well in math math. And there are gifted math math people that when they're in an application course, can't figure out how to use the math they've been studying, but they do really good with formulas. So I'm just saying that for you folks to step forward, and I know you're not all here tonight, Roger's not here, but what you are doing in the mathematical world to me seems to be honored, and those students need to get credit for how they're using math in your courses 
and begin to believe that they are mathematicians. They are. So I, I love what you're about to set out to do. I think your work is going to be hard. I think to coordinate between the math department and the science department, you're going to have so much extra time <laughs> that you're going to have to give to this. I thank you for stepping forward to want to do that. But I think if Holman does this, that's another kind of, whoa, that puts us on a cutting edge. And um, I appreciate that you're going to do this and that you've brought this forward. Thank you. Any questions? I have a uh, question. Now, where is it somewhere on the horizon getting a science credit for taking a tech ed class, such as one taught by Mr. King or one of yourselves, or are you just focusing on one project at a time? Not at this time. Nothing has been uh, stepped forward mm -hmm. from just talking at the moment, I guess. I know Mr. King has pursued some stuff, but I guess even though he's a part of our department, we still, this is our avenue we're going yeah, down, yeah. so I don't know what his direction is, but I know at the moment he's kind of at a standstill. Okay. I, um, just a quick comment, thanks. Um, I, my daughter's very visual, and she can do really well in math visually, geometry, that kind of thing. So, and I like your project-based ideas, because I think that's, uh, that's lost sometimes in the school system. If you're by yourself, and then you're shy, and you don't want to raise your hand because you're the dummy, not really, but you know what I'm saying? You, you, you create more teamwork learning that way. So I think you guys got, you're on the right track, so thanks. Thank you. The only thing I, question I had was the name. It kind of is, confu you know, the math component. I was thinking technology, and then when you, you know, read the description and have that, the, uh, so you might want to think about that. Just, I know it will probably be under your area when they register, but, it still might help to emphasize that. And it is interesting that you have to go to DPI to get that because a lot of courses that we have come before us, we approve it and it's an elective. But this is a little bit different, I think. So that is interesting that, that you're gonna have to take that step. And um, good luck to you and thank you, as Kate said, for stepping forward and taking this on. It, it really is, some people have that hands-on um, capacity. They can't take that from the classroom into the actual hands-on and so I think it's a big, big um, big Com step for us confidence builder too yeah that's really important well. so thank you and good luck to you yeah. thank, you. Yep. thank you thank you okay then the next item is 2015 16 budget input variables mr. Clark Ooh, this sounds like fun. I left for this <laughs> should have received in your board packet um, three documents related to uh, budget input variables for 2015-16 budget. The first is the issue paper, and I'm not going to spend any time on that. I'm going to get right into uh, some of the variables. The first variable is the enrollment variable, uh, probably the most important variable as we look at developing a budget. As you can imagine, uh, the number of pupils defines things like the revenue generated by the revenue limit formula. and rem Remember, that represents 93% of all of our revenue. It also defines things like our staffing levels, and staff being the largest single cost of the district. <clears throat> this is a revised um, enrollment forecast model uh, for us. Uh, this has been reviewed uh, by the facility committee, actually, as it relates to facility uh, growth in the district. I'd ask you to draw your attention to the bottom of the 2016 line that represents the 2015-16 school year. And we're forecasting a 1.19% increase in enrollment at this point in time. Now, for some of our staff members who might be looking at this, uh, they'd say, well, that's not our enrollment. Well, it's not probably the enrollment today. This is the enrollment on the third Friday in September, which is one of our official count <clears throat> dates. And we use that date each year uh, in our forecast model as well. 
Uh, so that would be one input variable you'd want to um, consider and be asking for approval at the next meeting. This as well as the other input variables. The balance of the input variables um, are on the second document uh, that was provided to you. And this focuses on the expenditure side of the budget. Um, if enrollment is the biggest uh, factor um, on the revenue side, um, and it also carries over onto the expenditure side, imagine the number of staff then um, and how that affects our uh, compensation expenses in the district. Um, we're forecasting here a 2% increase in compensation, salary, I should say, not compensation, but the salary component of compensation in all categories, except the alternative benefit plan option. And we're not planning on any changes to the design of the alternative benefit plan, but we experienced this last year, a reduction in the cost associated to the alternative benefit. And we're forecasting that again next year. And that reduction occurred because, remember, we grand personed some people, staff, at the time of uh, some time ago. And as those people uh, retire out of or leave the school district, they're replaced with individuals who have a lower alternative benefit plan uh, expense. Um, in addition, we found last year that some people migrated from the alternative benefit plan to the health insurance plan. And that too then reduces the alternative benefit plan cost. So a 5.8% reduction in that item. Uh, moving down and focusing more specifically on the teacher salaries because their uh, current compensation model is a little bit more complex. Um, you'll see lane change amount and supplemental amounts all included within that 2%. And if you look at the freeze in steps, we put yes. That doesn't mean that the board's making a decision to freeze steps at this point in time. It only means that would there be an additional compensation increase above the 2%. And this model says no, 2%. And if steps were not frozen, people were allowed to advance, then this model says that would have to reduce the 2% increase above. That's the model that we're presenting to you at this time. Um, we're having an average of about 12 people retire. We had one year um, in the last five years where there was more than that, but this represents a, a better average. And the uh, salary associated with um, retirees these are some of the input variables that we put into the formulas to develop uh, an initial budget projection. Moving down to benefit assumptions, uh, we're assuming that the FICA rate will not change. The Wisconsin Retirement System benefit, we have no information announcing a change. You remember there were changes in that in um, some recent years, but um, with the national economy uh, stabilizing somewhat, the, the, we aren't expecting any changes. Uh, life insurance, no change. Income protection is long-term disability. This is just a income protection, a name given by the uh, model that PMA helps us with. Uh, we have some early information that suggests there will be an increase uh, in that benefit cost. Uh, health insurance, we're modeling at a 5% increase. Dental insurance at a 2.5% increase. No increase in the uh, HRA or retirement annuity contributions. And you'll see that 0% increase then carrying on into the rest of the pages. And what that says to you is that uh, as we start with this budget model, things like utility costs, fuel costs, we're building in no increases on the front end. Those would have to be conscious decisions made as we move forward in the budget development process. At the start, though, 0% increases in all of those categories. And that carries on to the last page. Um, per pupil uh, categorical aid, um, we're looking at that increasing slightly. We'll build that into the model. And the reimbursement rate, another form of revenue for the uh, students with special needs, um, that amount has shown over the time to be gradually decreasing as a percentage. The state tends to keep the same dollar amount available, but as costs increase and the number of students increase, the percentage tends to drop. 
And I think that takes us to the bottom of the input variables. The intent of the input variables in our budget development process is to give us a general starting point. As you know, um, in past years, the board's gone back and adjusted those afterwards. But you need something as an agreed to starting point, knowing that it's subject to change. One thing that's not shown on this uh, sheet that you should know, um, based upon the recent ex year's experiences, um, we will this year be building in staffing increases to match the enrollment increase. That's a change from what we've done in past years. We've started out, much as with some of those others, with a zero increase. And you have to make the decisions uh, based upon the experience we had last year. I think we're wiser to just build that in. Um, so those would be the input variables we'd be presenting to you unless you have feedback between now and the next meeting. Questions? Just a quick question. Some of these estimates, such as the insurance increase, um, what was used to derive those numbers? What, what, where did that come from? Yeah, it's a desired target over time, more than it is based upon any claims experience that we have. We met with the um, Finance Committee and with the Personnel and Governance Committee and shared with them um, long-term trends, trends at 10% and showed how we just don't believe we can sustain that, so we need to do everything we can to target a 5% increase. So I would not say that's based upon some industry average or our own average. That's a desired budget outcome. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Then I think Jay, you're staying there for the next one with Dr. Carlson for fiscal sustainability goal. Well, back on November 24th, we presented you with information on the goal, and tonight we're going to continue that conversation, and I know that on the consent agenda, you do have this item for your consideration for approval. You'll have to determine whether you are, have enough information um, after this and uh, whether or not you want to move forward at that time. So tonight, we want to provide you with additional information surrounding your fiscal sustainability goal, including responses to many of your questions and comments from the November 24th board meeting. I'll, I want to begin by providing an overview of our strategic planning process resulting in this specific goal that's been presented to you mm -hmm. and the dollar amount recommended. As you read our vision, everything we do begins here. And we continue to reflect and come back to this. Equal, when we look at our mission, really our purpose as an organization, we are educating and inspiring students every day. We've committed ourselves to developing those so important 21st century learning skills. And you see the list. And as you think about this particular goal and some of those key areas that it's focusing on, you may want to pick out some of those from that list when you think of technology, for example. <clears throat> so how did we get here where we are, where the board is now considering increasing revenue per pupil? Prior to the start of the 2014 calendar year, the board approved six focus areas for the district. And again, some of my comments tonight, yes, are repeated from two weeks ago, but if we, uh, I believe and receive comments from you um, how significant and important this, this topic is for all of us. So the process started with our work with our consultant, Matthew Fail, as we committed ourselves to continuous improvement. 
the framework influenced by the Baldrige framework for performance excellence. This led us to revisiting our strategic <clears throat> plan and aligning it with performance categories of student achievement, workforce, fiscal sustainability, customer focus, that continuous improvement and leadership. Approximately 50 community stakeholders were part of examining the focus areas and identifying priorities and areas in need of attention and improvement, including student achievement specific in the areas of math and reading, as well as instructional technology and facility maintenance. The board then worked to develop goals within each focus area and approve the focus areas and goals last January. <clears throat> The board approved a fiscal sustainability goal to be achieved by 2019. A specific dollar amount was yet to be determined. The premise behind the goal was to address priorities that have been continually identified through the annual budgeting process, specifically the unmet and underfunded identification process. The board considered other stakeholder input, including the strategic planning community focus groups, as well as board and district committee level work. The board directed administration to research and, in, and then examine an appropriate and responsible amount and bring a recommendation to the board for consideration. So why technology and facility maintenance and transportation specific, specific to our vehicle replacement, Mr. Clark did present rationale at the November 24th meeting, but I'd like to expand on those comments. In 2009, some of you will remember, uh, the board approved a technology plan that called for a commitment to growing our instructional technology. Since then, the board has received multiple presentations and updates on our technology efforts. The board has consistently conveyed a message of the importance of using technology as an instructional tool, both in and out of the classroom. In the past three years, the board has been presented with conceptual plans uh, for incorporating technology in the classroom where you've had discussion, a thoughtful discussion on such things as uh, ranging from encouraging students to bring their own device into the classroom all the way up to, again, the district providing a device for each student at a one-to-one -one ratio. The board has led in making significant progress with updating our infrastructure and supporting our digital transition initiative that Mrs. Wee reports to you on several occasions, including professional development for teachers, which I would like to report to you is going very well. Over the course of the past three years, with your support, we have redirected more than $1 million to instructional technology, mostly in the area of updating our infrastructure. However, I have shared with the board that unless the board makes some decisions in repurposing dollars from areas that will likely impact personnel, I do not believe we have the financial capacity to achieve our vision for providing the desired instructional technology for our students and teachers within the time frame in which we want to achieve it. At the same time, we have recognized the fact that we are having to invest more each year to maintain our facilities. But we are not keeping up to the level we need to in order to prevent more expensive investment in the future. Part of this is due to our commitment to directing our resources to areas that have a direct impact on student learning. This is also why we have experienced over the years a challenge in maintaining our transportation fleet. The board should be commended for the financial decisions it has made in the past. Your decisions have been difficult, but you have made them after careful and thoughtful discussion and debate, and also based on the information available at that time. Your work is not easy, but as long as you keep focused on that vision and that mission, I know you will continue to make decisions that are ultimately in the best interest of our students. <clears throat> so 
So administration has been examining an appropriate amount for several months, and as Mr. Clark presented two weeks ago, uh, we are recommending a $263 per pupil increase, resulting in a total amount annually of approximately $990,000 by June of 2019, and that is based on that 3,800 student enrollment projection. So tonight you are asked to approve your revised goal. That was originally approved last January, but now includes the recommended amount. I'm gonna take some time, and we're gonna go through some of your questions and comments from two weeks ago, and I know some of them, Mr. Clark did a great job of right then and there trying to respond. Some of this will be repeated, but some of this will be additional information new for you as well. You should have received, um, I think a part of the status report emailed to you, and I believe, I hope it's part of the Dropbox now, even that separate document, which some of this information is more detailed for you and in print. So we've worked over the course of the past two weeks to do our best in developing a response to those questions and comments. And again, especially as we go through this after tonight or during, if, if we haven't gotten this exactly right, especially on reflecting questions and comments, we, we need to know either t tonight or <clears throat> immediately following. So is this referendum mainly for facilities? I think uh, I'm not going to assume anything. We think it might be um, clarified, but as previously shared, approximately two thirds of this overall dollar amount as part of your goal would be directed to technology. And this is another document It's going to be a little challenging to see, perhaps from the crowd, but um, again, this is a document that outlines, really, we didn't present the specific chart for you two weeks ago, but it really outlines kind of that plan, that implementation plan. Uh, in one way or the other, it may have been conveyed that the transportation and the facility maintenance, even from two weeks ago, we were looking at not really infusing that into the plan until the third year. So this is some new information. Since then, we've been able to do some work that we're comfortable in presenting. We'd be able to accelerate that to implement that in the second year. <clears throat> Are the proposed referendum questions for one-time expenditures otherwise uh, described as non-reoccurring, or are they for recurring expenditures? The recommended technology question would be for a specific duration of time, and the maintenance and transportation question would be recurring, much like the maintenance and operational costs when we construct school buildings. I'm prepared to go into ra more rationale about technology, but in and, and the difference between and how we arrived at this decision. But one of the things when you talk about technology, instructional technology, I'm pretty confident that four years from now, or at the end of this time, we will still have technology. And it's very likely we'll be coming back and looking for ways to increase revenue to continue this what we're doing with technology but we don't know what that exactly will look like as we sit here today and so for that reason we're recommending a fixed period of time because of that unknown technology is going to be with us but we don't know exactly how it's going to look unlike the facility maintenance and the transportation and the fleet replacement that's a, we can answer that and look ahead with and project with more certainty regarding those areas. And so that's a little bit um, of why, of how we've approached the recurring versus non-recurring of those areas. Please explain no net tax increase. Again, Mr. Clark, I believe, responded very well, but we wanted to bring this out because this is so important and uh, go through this again. The, the approval of the referendum questions will result in no net increase to current school property taxes. The passage of a referendum, if the board would choose to go in that direction, uh, does, not, does have a property tax implication 
the $990,000 approved under the revenue limits is going to be raised by taxes. However, the district has in place a long range financial plan that allows this impact to be fully offset, offset by other property tax reduction strategies. To have no net increase, what you have to do is structure that at a time when you otherwise would have a drop in taxes so that there is no net increase. In other words, I'm not asked to pay more. I think Mr. Clark said this last two weeks ago too. I'm not asked to pay more, any more than I paid the prior year, but I won't experience the reduction that would have otherwise occurred had I not approved a referendum. <clears throat> The district would use a combination of the following to create a net zero tax rate impact of state aid, long-term debt defeasance, and long-term debt levy reduction. Why is a reduction in taxes occurring? Again, the district annually collects property taxes to pay off long-term debt. Our long-term debt service tax levy is falling off because we are paying off Sand Lake Elementary School in 2016. This provides us with an opportunity, a window of time, when we can introduce this tax without increasing taxes. This is like the final payment of your home mortgage. While there will be continuing long-term debt for other past school construction projects, the end of the Sand Lake Elementary School debt will result in a long-term debt levy reduction in 2017. So by strategically placing the introduction of the facility maintenance and fleet replacement levy at the precise time the long-term debt tax levy is experiencing reduction, again, that net zero tax rate impact can be achieved. Will this have any long-range negative impact on our long-range building needs? If we were going to fill the entire drop that I referenced, that we are going to experience with a referendum question, that might be a concern, but this is a relatively small portion of that total drop, allowing us the capacity to continue to meet facility needs. With the $263 expense per pupil, do we have comparative data to show how the school district of Pullman compares to other districts in that, or other data in that same metric, and how do we fare? So what we've done is really we've gone back to what you have really defined in the past. Um, going back to May of 2011, the school board approved a financial performance target for comparative per pupil expenditures. That's reported out. We have that available. We often uh, review that. Uh, with the board as well. The school district has consistently operated within these target limits. In 2011-12, which is the most recent data we have through the Wisconsin Taxpayer Alliance, the upper target limit was 10,382, but the per pupil expenditure amount in that year was $9,991 for a difference of $391. So that is more than the $263 per pupil increase associated with what we are discussing and considering at this time. So this demonstrates that that amount, $263 per pupil, associated with this potential referendum question allows per pupil expenditures to remain in that, in your board approved target range. So we really think that is most important for you as a board we have data, I think Alex might have even two weeks ago referenced some data that's out there of a ranking compared to others, but I'm going to suggest you should continue to be focused on your target that you have established as a board. Here's the, and I don't know how well that comes off on the PowerPoint, but again, you have that available to you, and that is reported out in your annual report um, each year. And I would say we, uh, we do expect sometime soon and possibly we'll be able to update as we go along in the next few weeks, um, perhaps in another 2012-13 comparative data. And we're hoping to have that available here soon. 
Why does it seem that there are more referendums being held across the state than there used to be? And again, we, we attempted to respond, but some additional comments related to that. Prior to revenue limits, the board had the authority to increase and set the tax rate low or high. Today, the only way you can do it is through a referendum. It still comes down to choices for a local school district. You can discontinue doing something to fund something else you want to do. But what we've heard is that most people in our school district are happy with the things we do and they don't want something eliminated. Kind of a continuation of that theme. And before those limits were put on us, historically did school districts raise those limits. School boards, again, annually set the limits, sometimes increasing and sometimes reducing. We do not have data available on how often uh, it increased or how often it had reduced, but most people would like to say that prior to revenue limits, taxes did continue to increase. Two referendum questions uh, recommended, and one with a date certain goal, in other words, that fixed, and the other is ongoing. Would there come a point when that target of $263 per pupil would be reduced because now that technology money has come to an end and we've used it all? The two potential referendum questions combined result in revenue increases ranging from, again, that $335,000 for fleet replacement and facility maintenance all the way up to $990,000 when you add the technology. So when you divide it by that 3,800 pupil membership, the increased revenue ranges from that $88 per pupil to $263 per pupil. And that's consistent, again, with the statement or with the recommendation that we have presented to you, to you for your consideration. Are we going to revise the dollar amount annually? A similar, in many ways, a similar type question. The goal specifically talks about us working to achieve a dollar amount per pupil by 2019. It doesn't necessarily mean that we will achieve that amount each year. It is likely the dollar amount will be adjusted, as I've already alluded to. The student membership, for example, is a variable. And as our enrollment increases, then that per pupil amount would go down. Here as I just threw this in at this point, you've already seen it. It already was in, uh, earlier in the PowerPoint, but it tries to address this, this line of questioning as well. So does the $263 per pupil amount include revenue from sources other than the increased revenue from a potential referendum? Not at this time. The total revenue amount generated will be predetermined by the referendum questions that you would establish. By state law, a revenue limit exemption referendum must state a specific dollar amount. This means that as student enrollment increases, what I had just shared with you, that that total revenue generate, generated would remain the same. However, that per pupil amount would reduce. Reference was made to the district being cut $880,000, but that the difference was made up with a change in benefits for the employees. So the net cost for the school district was balanced or a wash. It was a part of that, that comment or that change in benefits through that retirement benefit contribution, the WRS contribution for employees was one example that assisted and helped out the district in balancing the budget. Again, the response, the eight, that amount, the $880,000, you may recall, is an amount that was referenced from budget discussions back in 2011. And at that time, Act 10 was reducing district revenue. In response, the district was searching for ways to balance the budget by reducing expenditures. During the 2011 budget development process, there was, again, one stage where that amount uh, that, that gap amount of $880,000 did need to be addressed. And in the end, and through much deliberation and work, ultimately by, on behalf of the board, we were able to balance our budget. I have more comments here as we go into more specifically talking about um, the state retirement contributions 
as well as health insurance renewals. And I'd be happy to uh, maybe I'd kind of reserve that if you have questions, but you do have that information, I believe, on, on that handout as well. And so I think I'll, I'll forego that piece right now, but I would be happy to, if you feel that's important enough to discuss, be happy to do that. So with that, we're with the timelines. Um, there is a little change. I know Mr. Clark had presented this two weeks ago. And the first slide here is the same, taking us through December 18th. And by the way, um, it will probably be reported out later tonight. Um, we started that with discussion within the facility committee tonight. On this next, as this timeline continues, um, you'll notice that, and I, you'll notice that in the middle there, we've added January 5th through the 8th of 2014. That's tentative, but we're working on perhaps a board workshop. And so it's a, it was just kind of, we're still working on that week and that day, but you can expect us to pull, to be uh, in contact with you and uh, to pull the board. It's a little dependent on where you're going tonight and even on December 22nd and what direction you're going to decide as a board. Um, but this would certainly be more geared towards helping you position yourself better, especially if you approve going in the direction of increasing that dollar amount. So with that, questions or more information needed, we're gonna do our best to leave here with ongoing questions. Again, this is on the consent agenda. You as a board need to determine whether you're comfortable enough of taking action tonight. And I hope this has been helpful. I know some of this is repeated, but we're ready for questions. Are there questions? Thank you for all the work. I mean, you know, we've talked about data and when we ask for data, how much work does it take? How many hours? Um, guessing this took a lot of hours. So um, I acknowledge that. However, I do think this is, these were important pieces of data we wanted. So I think the two of you and all of your staff who helped put this together can well, do that. Ms. Mayor, your, your, the comments and questions we received to you actually are helping us to continually develop a Q&A that we're going to be anxious to roll out here. Uh, we're looking for your direction and kind of where the board is headed with this. But so thank you. Um, here, every question you're asking of us to follow up on, we're actually looking to see, do we already have that? And if not, we're thinking about adding. Okay, any other questions? So I don't this, have a sure, question. Tim. Just more of a comment mm -hmm. as, as we get to this on the consent agenda. Um, and, and maybe it's just me, but I, I personally, and I'm, I'm sure you probably feel differently because you've been working on this a long time, but I really feel like we're fast tracking this. Um, um, really the, you know, the, the even, the first really <coughs> notice that you were even working on a possible referendum came at the, the last meeting. We got the status update, and thank you for all the answers to this information. It's awesome. But we got that on Friday, and the, the stuff wasn't really added to the Dropbox till today, which meant I really didn't get a chance to review any of it. And I just feel like not a lot of time to, especially with some of this recent information, to really digest it and getting to understand it. And so um, I, I'm thinking that, you know, maybe I could use some additional time to just dig through some of this as we get to the consent agenda. I could too. But I, it's overwhelming to me, but everything in this district is overwhelming <laughs> to some degree, and that's a good thing. But, uh, and I do think, I, I, I uh, me and Vic Tim, I think you guys have put a lot of time into it, but it's, it's a lot of information, and I know something was added today, and I didn't, <coughs> I didn't get home till six o'clock, so. Lisa? So is the question, do we feel we confident that we can vote on something like this tonight or not? The, to add it question, to the, the agenda. question that is on the consent agenda is setting the goal, fiscal right. sustainability goal, at what has been presented. That's all that is on the consent agenda tonight. 
So all we're really talking about is saying the goals that we've highlighted here, we're not specifically talking about referendum. No, I think they present the referendum information because it does sort of go hand in hand. There's, there's set, the dollar amount was as a result of the figure that they came up with for the referendum. Um, but we did, I think in response to um, Tim's comment, is we've been talking about a referendum for a while because we, I remember as a board last spring or summer, asked them to bring to us based on technology specifically at that time after Jan we had made a presentation about the timeline that it would take for a referendum in order to to move a referendum through and so there may have been a gap I agree Tim there's been kind of a gap between that but the discussion of doing a referendum has been out there on the table for a while um, so and I agree I agree too I think that we've been talking about technology and wanting the district to move forward because we're not up to speed with it we've already we've already made the decision on you know the staffing costs it's done and so we have to figure out how we're gonna if we're gonna move forward with this and continue with our goals we have to have a referendum to do it anyone but the question is to establish a $263 increase per student. As our fiscal As sustainability, goal. yes, goal. That's all. Yeah. We're maintaining. We're not, we're not like, it's not an increase even. No, it is an increase of, 200, of $263 dollars increase. increase in our per student um, dollar. So 11000 now. If the refer if we get the referendum goes forward and the, the dollar amount needed is, is nine hundred thousand, that represents an increase of two hundred and sixty three dollars a year spending per student. And but the last referendum that we had was a more significant increase, correct? Like the two thousand eleven, wasn't that? I thought that was the, the comparison we were looking at a or we were looking at something from two thousand eleven. I think saying, oh the 2000, you were talking about there was a more significant. I think he was talking about in 2011 is when Act 10 yeah. came about. Okay. And we, as a district, were going to, it was identified we were going to be cut about 880000 And what we did in order to make up for that was we went to benefits and employee um, net costs was zero because they were willing to make some adjustments as. I think one of them was the one Jay pointed out tonight, the reduction in the alternative benefit plan that at that time was frozen and reduced and that sort of thing. So, um, but we have asked the administration, as we talked about strategic planning, we um, had identified the fact that if we wanted to do the technology plan, implement the technology plan, unless we did something different, made cuts to other places, those sorts of things, we were going to have to increase our per pupil dollar amount, and that's why that goal came out last year. And to increase this per student, we felt like we needed to increase, we didn't have a number. And so we've asked the administration then to work on a number for us after listening to presentations from technology, maintenance, and um, transportation. Those are the three. They could have come up with others, but we, we rely on the administration to come to us with those recommendations. These are the three areas they've come to us and said, if we're going to increase it, this is the number, and this is how we think we can accomplish it, is through the referendum. So tonight, we would be just voting on the number. And then continuing the discussion, the timeline indicated the, the if we do go to referendum uh, in order to accomplish that increase, which would really be our only option, then that timeline indicates we need to move rather quickly, as, as Tom and Tim have indicated. Um, but. Mrs. Hancock? Yes. Again, is there a little flexibility? I mean, I'm, I'm listening as far as your work and consider, consideration for night, tonight. Could you delay that for December 22nd? I think when we look at the timeline, I think we could make that work. Um, as far as on that goal amount, which, yes, I think everybody sees how there's such a direct link 
to moving on to that next step of really looking at questions. So, but um, this will become even more important of really looking for a date um, as far as maybe bringing the board together at a special time. And um, we, whether that would be in advance of December 22nd, um, if that would be helpful to you, I know how challenging that would be. <laughs> um, but at a time, if nothing else, that first week of January. So that's, that's up to you. Any other, dis Kate? There's a really maybe. good article in the latest oh, edition sorry. from our school board journal that I think we all get mailed, um, school news. And it highlights three districts who have had referenda. And they explain why, because that question came up too, why are we having to do this? so often um, it highlights why school districts need to do this how things money in certain places has been frozen but needs are there you want to be competitive all kinds of myriad of reasons but it also gives what those three districts did to inform their public not just inform their public but to get the public's opinion so that by the time if and when we do go to referenda referendum we have already listened to our constituents we have explained to them what our needs are but we have also let them have some choice in what they feel is important and it's it's a brief article but um, and there's more on the website too but I think that's something if we're headed to that that the seven of us do need to investigate what's going on around the state and what is successful and what's going on what is this information that you said I'm sorry the the journal that you get as a school board member it's called school news and mine just came in the mail today but um, WASB website also has those articles listed and Kate I think as Dr. Carlson referenced, we attempted to do that through our stakeholders, the 20 stakeholders, and then also our most recent survey that we did um, related to compensation. We also included questions about the overall uh, feelings of the school district and came out very favorable um, as far as the responses there. So, so we are trying to get that feedback from our constituents and our stakeholders. So, so other questions? Gary. One more comment, mm -hmm. and that is, for, for as long as I've been on the school board, you've heard me talk about the converging lines where our, our income and our amount of costs are converging, and uh, we aren't going to be able to raise enough to meet our costs eventually. And I've been saying that for 10 years while well, we're there. And if, if we don't consider, at least consider sending $263 and consider a referendum, the, the, the school bus, the, age of the average age of the school bus is like getting up there around 12 years. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to pay. We're going to have to pay sooner or later. We're going to have to pay that. And it's about $4 a year from now or a dollar a day. And the same with the, the school budget or the maintaining the buildings. We've been talking about that for three or four years. That the budget did not allow us to maintain our building, take, care, take good care of our buildings. And it's got to come from somewhere. If you don't get more income because back in the olden days and not aging myself but back in the <laughs> olden days we set our own exactly. our own limit and we said hey we need some more money let's tax tax the people more we pass it to the board and away we went those days are gone and right now we need to <coughs> generate some capital you know to pay these things to have to be paid if we don't do it with this or consider doing it with this then something else is going to have to pay and I'm not saying that's the wrong thing but that money's going to come from somewhere. It's not going to come from the drop out of the sky. It's going to have to come from educational materials or te teacher staff or yeah, or whatever. And we can sure make that choice. But just so you know that there's there's going to be a cost one yeah, way or another. It's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. Oh, so other questions, comments? Okay. Well, then we will move on to the consent agenda. And we have six items this evening. We have the personnel report, financial claims and accounts, preliminary budget um, rankings of order of under and unfunded needs, fiscal sustainability goal, and the second reading of the rentals and service charges, community use of facilities, and commercialism and school policies. 
um, and the first reading of employee child at work um, policies. So I, unless someone wants to pull one of those items out there, out there, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. I would ask, and, and no surprise to anybody here, and I'm sure there's no one watching at home tonight, but they may watch later. Uh, I'm gonna ask that 10.4 be pulled out. Okay. Um, and I think we just do that. We don't need to have a motion or a second. We just have done that. Um, so I would then entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented without item 10.4. I would so move. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then item 10.4, fiscal sustainability goal. And I would make a motion on item 10.4 to refer that to the December 22nd meeting to allow for additional study and review. Okay. Is there a second? I second. Okay. A motion has been made and seconded to um, refer that to the December 22nd board meeting. All those in favor? Please, or any discussion? I'm sorry. Any discussion? I just have a discussion point. Does this mean then in between now and then we would have an opportunity to find out more information yes. and have a meeting with members, board members, educational, whatever? Well, Dr. Carlson mentioned that as a potential opportunity for us to meet between now and the 22nd on this uh, workshop. Um, that would be dependent on board interest. I mean, I think if we're going to I mean, we've been given a lot of information and we did, haven't had a whole lot of time to look at it, but I do think it seems like there's discussion that, mm -hmm. or... And I don't know if we need a separate meeting, but, you know, Kate mentioned some great articles in the school news that, you know, would be great, I think, to read, and I know that just came out, and I have not, it's sitting in my mm -hmm. kitchen, Nicely. but I haven't had a chance to read it yet, and, and you know, I know we've just got a lot of information that we just got that, uh, you know, I, I may have questions, I may not, I just want to digest it, and certainly if I did, I would certainly direct them. To Dr. Carlson. Good. I'm going to practice something tonight. Uh -oh. So one of the things we talked about at our last workshop was information <coughs> requests and data requests. And as Kate mentioned, this information probably took a great deal of time for them to, to um, pull together. So are there, is there other information that you feel that you have your pulse on at this point in time that would be helpful to you? Or is it just a matter of maybe having an opportunity to look further into the information that we have and further review it and, and be comfortable and maybe have some conversations about it? Option B yes. for me. Option B. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Because if you do have information you'd like to have pulled, here I am practicing. Um, one of the things we're talking about is data requests. And so keep in mind that if it does take time for data to be pulled together and that sort of thing. Two weeks is just two weeks. Um, but we, we are working toward a process where we are identifying data that is going to help us make a decision. Um, sometimes data and information can be, you know, what, what does Matt say, data rich, information poor or something. Yeah. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind as you're putting together that information and then work with Dr. Carlson on that and he will then share that with all the board members. But we've got a checklist that as we in the future are going to be doing this that we'll be looking through and, and ha having every board member possibly quiz themselves. Um, and one of the items is how much time is this going to take for administration or, or staff to pull together kind of thing. So a good question. Uh, yeah. On Dropbox with all these documents, how long would they stay there so we can look at them? I know they disappear after a while. They go they're to a different place. Oh, they are. They, okay. So they are out there, okay. Tom. So okay. they just go to a different place. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So we can show you where that is. So. Any other questions? Good conversation, Gary. Did you? I'll just say we had a motion and a second. Yeah, there is a motion and a second on the floor and a, gu a game to be seen um, to um, delay the discussion or the action on that fiscal sustainability goal until the 22nd. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 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 I would like a hand vote, please. For nay. For nay. I'm sorry, all in favor, please raise your hand of delaying it until the 22nd to delay the vote to delay the vote and then we were just till the 22nd I know I heard you and then all against all opposed nay one two three four. No, we were voting on it. to delay the discussion till the 22nd oh to delay it till the 22nd right. 
versus having a discussion Be versus prior putting to that. keeping it in our consent and, well voting on it tonight okay I thought we were saying that we weren't we didn't need to do that we didn't need to vote to do that we pulled out the fiscal sustainability goal okay. and that and a motion was made and seconded okay. to delay discussion or action on fiscal um, sustainability goal until the 22nd and so if you vote in favor of that then you are voting in favor of delaying it if you're voting against it then you're saying no take so, action tonight I so I'll, I'll just let her ponder that one second. So all those in favor, please raise your hand again. In favor of? Delaying the vote on fiscal sustainability till the 22nd. So I have two and all opposed. Raise your hand, please. One, two, three. And I would vote yes, and you did. So, so then I would entertain a motion to approve the fiscal sustainability goal. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? I, I, I'm sorry, but for a board of education that has education in its word, the fact that we don't want to give the public as well as board members the proper time to study and educate this is a shame. And I want it noted that my no <coughs> vote will not be a reflection of I don't think these needs are important, but my no vote is around the process. I have seen process in Madison, unfortunately, oh, that please has don't been go there. Please okay, please, just please be respectful. So you're Jim, against this Madam motion. President, do we not have board norms? Yes, we Thank do. Thank you. And I'm just saying that process is important. Yes. And I'm entitled to my opinion. And I would just like to respect my opinion. And I would like to think, think that we have some decorum and we're not going to practice Madison style politics here at this level. May I just I'll briefly say everything Tim said, I agree with because I know that we have given the public a lot of time. This came up a long time ago. So every argument that he is using that makes us feel with our vote that we have not done right by the public. I just want to put that on record too that I disagree with that. And according to Norm, mm -hmm. which we bring up, I too have a right to say that. That if you if you make me feel like I've done something wrong with my community, with my vote, mm, I'm not gonna go there. And I need to support and let the public know there's a lot of time for you to weigh in on this. We still have so many steps to go to and what this will look like and be comfortable with that and do not be instigated by feeling that you've been negated. Anyone else? Um, I'm just, uh, I feel that uh, it's important to really step through it slowly. Not too slowly, I understand, because we do have um, things to look at but uh, even Kate commented the magazine that I, I didn't see it in my house yet and uh, Wayne Greenhorn so I just uh, I think that technology is important but I also think waiting a little longer is not going to kill us to ask more questions so other comments or questions Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the fiscal sustainability um, goal as presented by the administration. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 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 Motion carries. And I think Tim had asked to have his um, nay vote addressed. Thank you. Okay, then I would move on to board member reports and discussion. Call on board members in the order of the roll call. Ask them to present any comments or committee reports you have. Anita Jagosinski. Um, I have nothing at this time, and I, well, we have a personal and governance committee meeting this Wednesday that, well, we did. We did. We don't know. Yeah. Cheryl will be gone. My daughter is presenting her capstone for her master's program, so I will be gone. And I don't know if we're having a personal and governance committee <laughs> meeting on Wednesday. Um, and I think that's all. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, let me find my list. Kate Mayer. Nothing. Tim Menninger. 
A couple of items this evening. First off, it was absolutely wonderful to see the crowd here earlier this evening. I always get uh, particularly engaged um, when we have, um, you know, obviously the students here in attendance as well. And I uh, really want to thank those um, that took their time out this evening, both uh, the band students as well as the DECA students. I think it is always an absolute uh, wonderful treat and encourage more of that uh, participation. I uh, would like to remind the board that there is a public hearing tomorrow on the Badger Cooley line. And uh, certainly I know that it's 3 o'clock at the town of Holland. Um, if they are able to attend, I know that uh, there will be some district representation there. Uh, but certainly encourage the um, board um, to if they are able to attend that as well. We also had a Buildings and Grounds Committee earlier this evening. Um, one of the things that came up just briefly that I will be um, reaching out to the uh, board president to potentially put on a future agenda is um, commercialism in schools. We looked at that policy tonight, but the discussion came in as how do we manage it, how do we promote it, how do we uh, support it, and what direction would we like to take. We have the policy, uh, but how do we want to implement that basically, and how do we want to promote that? So. Uh, that will be something that um, that committee would certainly like some board direction on to uh, the time certainly spent um, engaging that as well. And then um, certainly the last thing I want to mention, and I think sometimes that um, these things get overlooked, and I was certainly glad to see a little more recognition of it. Yesterday was uh, Pearl Harbor Day. And, um, you know, I know we often talk about, um, you know, the, the uh, great um, support of our veterans and and to me w you know when we look at that generation they're oftentimes referred to as the greatest generation I don't think that um, although there's been many sacrifices since I don't think since that time has an entire country had to make such a great sacrifice as a whole and um, you know those veterans continue to get less in number and I certainly think it's very important to continue to recognize uh, not only the veterans, but really the entire country's contribution to that effort. And uh, do not forget, and I think Pearl Harbor Day is a great um, remembrance of that as well, and did not want to let that day go by. Um, and then last item, um, it just kind of went very quietly, but we did have an item on the personnel report with the resignation, and I just certainly want to say thank you. Hey, thank you. Lisa Collins. Um, just in talking with... Jay Clark thinking about our discussion tonight with fiscal sustainability goals and I think people still wanting to have more information even though we're keeping it on um, that we could have a discussion about that at the Finance Committee meeting which is next next week um, Monday at 4 30 or 4 o'clock 4 to 5 30 and it's here um, upstairs so I mean I think you know Tim or anyone else you know, obviously you're on the finance committee too um, that we could talk more about that and be able to process that I think some of us may need more processing than others but it's an opportunity to do that okay uh, Gary Dunlap I just wanted to comment about the uh, the crowd here too it's always nice to see a bunch of people here and I as you know well know I just love that band <laughs> <laughs> I think they sound good. It's so funny because they were all sitting in a row back there, and I went back. I said, I love you guys. And they go, We love you too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a great bunch of kids. Um, I also would like to say uh, thank you to the greatest generation. And then uh, remember Pearl Harbor Day. Okay, thank you, Gary. Uh, Tom Cruise. Yeah, I would also like to thank the greatest generation. My uh, father served in World War II, my wife's father served in World War II, and our, uh, my wife's uncle, who passed away two weeks ago, also it served was, in World War II. Exactly. So they, so they did pre protect our freedoms that we uh, often take for granted sometimes, <clears throat> but uh, certainly not everybody in this room doesn't take it for granted. Um, as far as the voting on the sustainability, I would like to have thought that would have kind of gone through the Finance Committee, at least something to that, that effect that's doesn't I don't know it just seems kind of backwards to me that we didn't that we didn't come across that first in our in our area I don't know why maybe that doesn't happen in the school system but it seems like we're on finance we should have seen that first and I felt a little bit that's one reason I didn't vote for it because I am on that committee and I didn't know anything about it so that's not good so but anyway I also enjoyed the band greatly um, 
I think it's, uh, it's neat how they had the competition, the teamwork, and I think that, I think the, watching Michelle speak, and I, uh, I, I'm a big advocate of the band. I've, she's called us a couple times when my daughter was in band, concerned about her. She, her, her heart's in it big time, and you saw how emotional she got at the end. That says something about an educational, or exceptional educator, so. I, um, and the DECA people too. Um, I'm gonna try to make it over there and see if I can uh, buy something for Christmas too. Buy a sweatshirt. There you go. Um, Alex Zachary. Um, I have a few things. Um, a thank you to the AP Gov kids who came out. They were here earlier, but they left. I don't know where they went. Um, it's always good to have such student participation. Um, it's already been a pretty jammed week, um, student government wise, or trying to slowly build that back up to something substantial. Um, the band? What we're doing is important and um, we want to be all board have all board members engaged and so he would be willing to do that via uh, teleconference kind of thing. Um, and the band funding, I know, I can't believe it was 2003, it had to have been two years ago. I mean, that's how it feels to me that we got the new uniforms, but I'll take them at their word, but yeah, it is. You know, it raises that question because it wasn't but a few years ago that we were having some of the same discussion about co-curricular activities and how they're funded. And, you know, we have what we call site-based management and funding and maybe, I, you know, I don't know if we want to take a look. We did a couple years ago at our budgeting process. Um, do we want to continue with this? Maybe it's not working or are there ways for those um, administrators at the, the schools at the sites to ensure that funding because band instruments was something that came before us not too long ago too and I think we need to have in place a process where those things are going to be addressed or if it is so much outside of the realm of what is doable what is ex uh, affordable then maybe we need to set aside some kind of fund on an annual basis, kind of like what we have done with technology in some of those areas where we've done a one-time kind of thing, increase their budgets. And maybe that's what we need to do is start looking at something like that to address some of those really big needs. And I know, um, having worked with Jay Clark for so many years, I can just see his head spinning. You know, we, we want it to be something that isn't then going to just be put off so people just don't spend their, their building allocations on it because they know there's going to be that buffer somewhere along the road. I think we want to have some of those safeguards. But I don't think it would be probably too difficult for us to identify a handful of those kind of activities and classroom programs where it's difficult to keep up with the funding uh, just through the normal means and maybe we can address it that way. So it's just something I've been thinking about um, th through tonight's meeting um, as we've heard some of those comments. Because we really do, Alex, and, and for your band comrades, we really do support music in the schools. There are some schools that are eliminating music and art programs. And so we have worked very hard to try to not ever even have to say that. <coughs> And I don't think, you know, it's something we don't want to do, so, um, but we, we maybe need to be more creative. Maybe there's some ways we could be more creative in doing some of that. So. And I, I think we're extremely blessed to have a program that's continually growing. Yes. I know this year they split off into two bands, the high, uh, upper band, lower band. Um, I, I guess my hope in coming years is that we're a little less blessed um, in the growing numbers, but by the looks of the numbers, that's not going to happen. Well, we hire good people and they attract, they, they you know, do. attract they do. students, so that's a, a real compliment to her. Too. It, it's not just a, a class, it's really a culture. Um, I would entertain the idea of us as board touring the band when they have their class and seeing the instruments that they have to play. Because they're, they're crude, some of them. They are in bad shape. And, you know, even the uniforms that they have to wear. So. So um, then moving, that's all that I have for this evening, except I will not be here on the 22nd, so I do want to say happy holidays to those in the Holman land, so I won't see you on the 22nd, but um, that is our next board meeting. We have a meeting on January 12th.
The education convention is the 21st to the 23rd in January, and then the 26th we have a regular board meeting. So any reflections on tonight's meeting? <clears throat> Okay, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. Discussion, seeing none. All those in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay, motion carries.